The following interview was conducted with Gabriel Sabendi, Professor uh, of Industrial Engineering and Chair Professor, Head Department of Industrial Engineering at Tsinghua University in Beijing, the People's Republic of China, for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Tuesday, September the 2nd, 2008, in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and siblings in early years. Oh, thank you. Um, I was born in Budapest, Hungary. My parents lived in the former Czechoslovakia in a small town called Rimavska Sobota, which was about two hours drive from Budapest. So my mother went up to Budapest to deliver me in a big hospital rather than in a small town. And then in 1949, my parents immigrated to Israel and I was educated in Israel until 1962. You went to grade school and high school there? Tell yeah. us a little bit about that. Yeah, I, I went to school there in Israel. I went to grade school and then I went to trade school. Instead of high school, I went to trade school where we learn to do things such as soldering, welding, operating a lathe and doing the type of thing that skilled uh, mechanics would do. And then... Can I, where were you living in Israel? Can, what city were you? Oh, I was living in Haifa, Haifa, which is a port city in Israel. At that time, it was the third largest city. Well, the largest one is Tel Aviv. The second largest is Jerusalem, and Haifa was the third largest one. That time it had about 130,000 people. Today it has about 350,000 people. And it has the most beautiful beach. And when I was in Israel, I was very active in sport. I had my Israeli record in weightlifting, which lasted for seven years before they broke it again by somebody else. So and I was active in shot put in track and field and on the team in rowing. So I had a lot of sport activity. Then in 1962, my brother graduated in medicine from Vienna and I went out to join him to have a trip across Europe. And then my last stop was London, England and I fell in love with London and I stayed there. Initially work. Actually my first work, I didn't speak English at all, very little. And I thought ironing meant ironing. I didn't think ironing was ironing. I thought it was to do with iron. And I thought it was something with sheet metal. And I said, oh, I'm a tradesman, I could do it. But when I arrived there, they actually were looking for somebody to iron ties and I got the job for nine pennies a dozen, and I revolutionized iron ring ties because I developed a system where I could iron ties simultaneously with two hands, which later on I realized was a good industrial engineering uh, approach. Um, I then got a job at a company called Ganson Sortex, to get them become more efficient. And oh, by the way, uh, as, um, this company was a seed sorting company and they capitalized on optical, optoelectrical methods of sorting commodities, seeds, beans, that type of stuff. And the job I was assigned there is to do work methods and method study. But I didn't like to do it because I didn't think that was very important. And I wanted to do two other things. One, I got all the items, parts that we manufactured there. And I got it out for outside bidding. Everything was before that manufactured from sheet metal. I got bidding in and we manufactured and everything for plastic molding and fiberglass and we cut the cost of the material by 30 percent 
And then I also decided that we need to produce machines to sort expensive commodities such as coffee beans. And I done market research for it and we then produce that product. And subsequently there was a write-up about my activity there. I was a young kid, 23, in the London newspaper. And at that time I shared the apartment with a person who was a postdoctoral at Brunel College. And his department had contacted him, not knowing that he knew me. He asked him to contact me if, I, if he could get me in to come in and talk to their MBA class. But I told him that, hey, it's not good because I really don't have an MBA. I first would like to get an MBA. And I also told him, now here's the shocker comes to you. I also told him that I never finished high school. I don't have a high school diploma and I don't have an undergraduate degree. So the department wanted to meet me and for somehow he was he liked it and I talked to him that I needed to get in to do the MBA. He said, but we cannot get you in because you don't have any of these things. You don't have undergraduate degree, you don't have a high school diploma. So he said he will check it with the university and after about three weeks came back, he said I could join it but couldn't get an MBA, I could get a diploma. So I joined it and I got the diploma. I was very lucky, there were about 90 people and I ended up to be the number one ranked student in the class. So then he offered me to stay there to do some work. In How long did it take you to get the diploma? Was that a one year? I worked full time, it was a sandwich course, one and a half year sandwich course. And then um, I told him I'm really interested in this subject that you talk, people talked about, about ergonomic. He said, we don't do it, but I'm going to Liège, Belgium, to meet with the head of department from University of Birmingham. I will talk to him. Anyhow, we submitted a, a, my resume there, and, and they didn't want to get me, but they were impressed with what I'd done at that company, and they gave me the opportunity to interview, and they let me in to the master program in Birmingham, but I couldn't get my master degree. I could get only a diploma. But I was doing, again, extremely well there. Again, I was the number one. Colin Drury, who was in the meeting, was number two. And then they offered me to get a master de degree with thesis. So I got it. And then when I was doing my master degree, I wrote a proposal which the department had liked, which was submitted to the British Labor Department of Labor was funded, and that was my PhD, and then they made me a senior research fellow, which means I got twice the money that other people got. And then I done my PhD there for one year, but I realized I had to do many things, so I, for example, I went to the head of Department of Statistics because I wanted two students to work on a certain aspect of my dissertation to describe the characteristics of shift in histogram performance time. So the head of department agreed and I supervised then two students for my PhD from statistics and I also had two students from industrial engineering that I supervised. So I actually supervised four master students when I was doing my PhD, and then I finished my PhD. And what's the name of the school again? Uh, University of Birmingham, Thank Department you. of Engineering Production. And then I wanted to come to the United, oh, I got an offer in Birmingham, but I didn't like it because it, the offer is determined on your age, and I wanted the offer to be determined on my achievement. So I decided I wanted to go to America, and I wrote to every industrial engineering department in America uh, for a job. And there was a lot of letters. Yeah, and there was no word processing, each one separately typed. And I got two offers at that time. I remember I got from Texas Lubbock and I got from Buffalo, New York. And we went to Buffalo, New York in 68. 
Were you married by this time? Yeah, okay. married and had one kid of one year old. And then we stayed there for two and a half years until in 71 May, during the IIE's annual conference, Professor Jim Barani came to me and said, oh, we have an opening here. Would you like to come one year as a visitor? I said, no, I'm not really interested as a visitor. Oh, would you be interested to come on a regular appointment? Yeah, I said, I'm very interested. So about a week later, I got a phone call at that time from the head of the department, Ferd Leinkula, who invited me for an interview. I came down next week. I got an offer a week later, and then I remember I was asking Professor Leinkula, what is the level of support for my appointment? How many full professors support? How many? He said, all full professors support. I said, I'm coming. He said, don't you want to hear about the offer? No, I said, I'm coming. Anyhow, and then I came here in 71, and then I was here ever since. There were two interesting activities occurred. One was in 1982, the Japan Management Association made a special conference to celebrate their 40th anniversary. And they invited three people to give the keynote address. They invited the chairman of IBM Europe, the chairman of NEC Corporation, and me as a young kid. And when I came there after the meeting... Where I, was the meeting held? In Tokyo, Japan. The chairman of NEC Corporation invited me for lunch and indicated that he followed my research for a number of years and would be very interested to give me an NEC professorship. I didn't know what to do, and I called Professor Leinkula from Japan. I said, it's a very unusual situation. The chairman wants to give me a chair professorship, but it's usually given by the university, and he wants to establish the funding for it. What do I do? So at that time, Professor Leinkula talked to Dean John Hancock, who was the Dean of Engineering, and he said, go for it. And then I got the, subsequently the details were worked out, and I got the NEC professorship, initially for five years, and it was renewed two times. I had it for 15 years, till 99. So that's kind of was a very interesting um, right. time period here. And um, Purdue really has been extremely good uh, to me and to the faculty because it enabled us all to develop to our fullest potential without any restriction. And that I think is pretty good. Some other universities, you have boundaries, and here, we could get involved in anything we wanted. Of course, there are some ironies. When I came here, I had an, in 71, I had an NIH funding, which paid $95,000 at that time. You brought that year. with you? Yeah. And I remember at that time, Professor Leinkula, the head of the department, told me, don't talk about the money to anybody because nobody has that much money. There's only one faculty, a Professor Barrage, who has a $60,000 NSF funding, and they would think it may not be good, so don't mention to anybody. Well, today it would be a different game. And then I remember in about 1975, 76, he came to me and he said, because all my research was in healthcare, dentistry, surgery, and hyperactivity. And he came to me and he said, you know, the professors, food professors really like you, but they all conclude that what you do, healthcare, is not engineering, is not industrial engineering. And if you want to get promoted, you really need to move into the mainstream manufacturing. Of course, it's irony because today, Everybody likes to move into the healthcare, and manufacturing is kind of 
not with it quite. Um, so I really have been blessed with very excellent colleagues at Purdue and students and um, now in 2008, which is exactly 40 years after I started my academic career, I am retiring, but I'm really moving in to other jobs. I'm continuing my chair professorship and headship at Xinhua, where I want to bring that department to the very top internationally. And I started a major new initiative as the chief scientist on major IT initiative in Europe. And I will continue editing the two scientific and technical journals, which I funded about 20 years ago. Let me ask you, do you want to make a couple comments on some of your research, for, certainly in the ergonomics, how that's mm. changed? Uh, you like for researchers, I think yeah. you share that. Yeah, uh, the way research is changing very drastically. An example, my early research was in psychomotor skills, manual skills in industry. I was concerned about selecting blue color workers training blue-collar workers and designing the workplace for blue-collar workers. But when I came to the United States, to the faculty, I realized that I couldn't obtain funding in this area. There wasn't much interest. And so then I said to myself, what can I do? I have pretty good background in the manual skills area. Where could I use it? And that's the reason why I came in with dentistry and surgery because I thought I could transfer my basic knowledge from the manufacturing area of psychomotor skills to the healthcare area where it badly needed. And of course, as, you went, as I went in, I realized that uh, uh, merely the performance by itself is not a key determining factor, that motivation and stress are critical attributes, and then my research led to it how do we reach a situation where we have some level of stress because you need some level of stress in the workplace but where your stress is not too high and not too low just enough to motivate you and so we develop criteria for it how you achieve it and then subsequently about the last 20 25 years we realized that in the early 1980s that computers come to the workplace and start to dominate our lives. And we realized in early 80s that people had difficulty using computers and other systems, even such as VCRs. And yet what, the, what difficulties did you experience? Did they that people, had, they couldn't use it. So for example, if even 15 years ago, if you give a VCR to an older person and ask them to program five different programs in five different channels on different dates, they had not the foggiest idea how to do it. So we had a lot of technology out, which was very sophisticated, very good, but people actually couldn't use it, overwhelming amount of number of people. So then my interest turned, how do we help the engineers to design IT systems that people actually can use easily by all segment of society, everybody. You don't have to be a nerd to use it, but that anybody could use grandma, grandpa, people who are in humanities who have no aptitude to computer. And if you think now, a lot of that has been accomplished by my students, that a lot of things today we can do and fairly layman people who have no knowledge on computer, have no idea how computer works, at least they can go into the computer, surf the web, find some information there, they can send their email to their grandchildren, their friends. Photographs. And photograph and you know, and so that really has been our forte the last about 20 odd years. That we, and in order to help it excellent, I started an international journal about 20 years ago, and I started a conference about 25 years ago, which is now the largest conference of its type in the world. We had the last two conferences each, we had 2,300 people, and it's strictly on designing computing systems for ease of use. 
and that has been extremely successful. Right. Mm. Could you also address a little bit for the researchers? You have you wear two hats. Also, the uh, university in China. And yeah. How that, that's rather unique that you yeah. maintained and kept. Yeah. Uh, now in China, the Chinese government uh, decided to establish a department with an international head. This was the first time since 1949, the establishment of People's Republic of China, that the foreigner was invited. So it was a delegation, about a dozen people from China. They visited the major universities here. Actually, not but they went to, basically went to Michigan and Abo, went to Georgia Tech, went to Berkeley, Stanford here, and they went to Aachen in Germany. And. Um, they came after the visit. They came back to me and offered me the position of the head, but they wanted me to take it as the head to give the money to me. Of course, I had a full-time appointment. I could, even though it was good money, hundred thousand U.S. dollar, but I couldn't take it. So the money they paid hundred thousand is actually paid into Purdue IE account, which I then use it for student and other type of activities. Um, and the purpose there is not really to be just the head of department, but we are a model for educational reform in China. So what we do is being then emulated in the other departments at Xinhua and in China. For example, all our books are in English. Do all the students, are they, are they bilingual? They speak they have, Chinese? Yeah, everyone, every book is in English and we actually I signed agreement with the major publishers, Prentice Hall, McGraw Hill, Wiley, uh, Taylor and Francis, whereby Xinhua Press, Xinhua Press is like MIT Press, they reprint the English book in China and the publisher gets about one dollar per book sold, something like that. And uh, I actually had to write the first page and actually my writing on it so that it has to be embedded there. They can't kind of print it illegally. But that is kind of working quite um, well. And you see the department there is uh, moving extremely well. Um, it started in 2001. Well, that's when the department started? Yeah, I started in 2001. And in 2006, October, uh, 2006 five years later, we had it evaluated by six members of the National Academy of Engineering in the USA came over and they ranked us in the top 20 worldwide so we were very pleased and we are moving further down the road. I think within the next three years we'll be in the top 10. We have very strong support from the central administration. So anything we want to do always get okay. I give you just an example. We originally wanted 25 faculty in the department. So I realized that in order to really achieve my full potential there with the department, we needed 35 faculty. So I go to the president and I say, you really need 10 more, no problem. Do you need any document? No document. I said, oh, by the way, and we also need so much money for the laboratory. Space. How much you need? So you need about four and a half million. Mm -hmm. so about half. No problem. So the beauty is, in effect, that we we get responses yes, just on the support that I request. But I don't request anything unreasonable. Right. Right. And you see, in American university, it would be impossible for a department head to get an increase of ten faculty positions. And if they get, they would have to write a major report of justification and how each one would be used and why do you need it. And uh, so it's not very rewarding there. It's very rewarding in terms of the impact. And we have a lot of the international top universities that, you know, partner with us. Do you know, some of the students that are there, have they come to Purdue? Uh, yeah, uh, well, actually not for exchange, they came in to join the PhD program. So they came for, to, to graduate work to, here? To do the graduate work. We had about a dozen people came over to do the graduate work. 
the university is, uh, what other departments do they have there, and what's the size of the school? Okay, uh, the department, uh, the university has 57 departments, and it has about 23,000 people. Uh, it's very heavy on graduate. For example, it has 800 postdocs. You see, it has 800 postdocs, which is a very large number. Is it primarily postdocs. engineering, or are there other uh, disciplines? Engineering is the main engineering and science related to engineering. So physics, chemistry, and mathematics. But engineering is really where it shines. And it's about, you see, the interesting thing is they admit 2,500 undergraduates a year to the university. Now, in order to be admitted, similar to the SAT, the, the exam is a little different, you have to score in the 99.99 .99 or higher to be considered for admission. So, if you take the West Lafayette High School, graduates about 150. So if you would have 70 graduate schools, uh, 70 high schools equal to the West Lafayette High School, one of them would be admitted from 70. So from the state of Indiana, I would say maybe to one, one would be admitted maybe, one person. So the quality of the student admitted is unbelievable. Yeah. In effect, the person from MIT, who is a very eminent professor, Tom Sheridan, he said, the student swept me under the carpet at Chihuahua. There's nothing like that at MIT. Interesting. Is it? And about a month ago, I was on a trip with the provost. One of the jobs I've been making, I'm helping to improve the quality of research at national laboratories in the US. And in one of the sites, I went with the provost That's of Harvard good. University. I actually went to Aberdeen, and he said, you know, we don't have that quality students at Harvard that you get it. And he said, can we develop a relationship? So now we, I'm developing a <laughs> collaboration with Harvard. It, it's very incredible, yeah. yeah. Let's talk a little bit about some of the awards. One of the ones that you got is that one from the USSR. That's kind of unique. The only recipient. The, yeah. Uh, I, I think probably the most significant one, if I may talk about the most. Please do. Yeah. I think the most significant ones are, I would say, three that are very, very unique. One is the National Academy of Engineering. The reason is because in 1990, I was the first and only person from the whole discipline of human factors and ergonomic inducted to the academy. And there are, roughly speaking, about 19,000 members. So that, I think, was very big in, in, in 1990. The second big one, I think, was when in 1995, the Chinese Academy of Sciences gave me an honorary doctorate because at that time they were in existence for 45 years in China for, and I was only the fourth person in their entire history getting it. So that I think was a very big one in 45. And ask, I mean, did, how did you find out about it? I usually try to ask that. Do they? Oh, you see, I tell you, say, getting into the National Academy of Engineering, I tell you, uh, Professor Leinkula was at that time the head of the department. I get a regular letter uh, from the president congratulating me in the, uh, that you have president been... President of the university? Uh, no, president of National Academy of Science. And I go to Ferd, I said, do you know, everybody get it? Is it a joke? I said, what's happening here? He said, oh, no, no, I have worked with a person, Jerry Nadler, Professor Jerry Nadler. He said, I work with Jerry Nadler on information, but it was confidential. I couldn't tell you about it. And you have been... So I had not the foggiest idea about it. I knew nothing about it, nothing. The same occurred, I tell you, the same occurred actually with all three. The same occurred with the Chinese. I had no idea about it. And then I see the third one that I thought would be the most significant one was the John Fritz Medal. Uh, I got it two years ago. The reason why that is the most significant one as a third one because this is the highest award in all of engineering and 
no Purdue engineering faculty ever got it. In the history of Purdue, never a Purdue faculty ever got it. And the people who got it before are so eminent that it's kind of embarrassing to be there. There's Alfred Nobel, um, Edison, I mean, all the, you know, the key people, the, like the, the key people and you work up, you know, uh, Bechtel, you know, see, I mean, all the big, the, so those three, I would think, are probably the most significant one and unique, even though the last one, I'm very proud of because the last one is not so important, but I was nominated by Henry Yang. Henry Yang was the Dean of Engineering here. I don't know if you remember. He was in for about 10 years. Jim Barani would know Henry Yang. And now he's the Chancellor of the University of California. At Santa Barbara. At Santa Barbara. And so I was very much touched. Frankly, the award is not so great. It's okay, but you know. <coughs> I was touched that he's a Chancellor of the University is nominating not one of his members from the university, nominating me from another university. I have nothing to give him. I have nothing to offer him, <laughs> you know, and I was really touched, even though that award is it's just an award. I but mean, it's behind it and how it came about. It's yeah, nice with Henry, I, I really, when I got the deal, and I didn't know about it, nothing. And, and I, but Prabhu said Henry contacted him because I got this deal and I noticed that in the letter that comes in, it says the originator was Henry Yang. I didn't want to call him up first. I, well, so I went to Prabhu. He, you know, he said, oh, he said, Henry contacted me. We provided the information. We worked, Shandy and I worked to provide. He wanted the information for it. So I was touched on it, not that not, because of his position. And you see, if he would be the president of Purdue and he nominated me, Oh, by the way, when I got the Fritz Medal, I got the biggest flower boutique from the Provost. With the nicest writing. The Purdue Provost? Yeah, Is yeah. There and Sally Mason? Sally Mason. I got, I don't know, I mean, a huge, I mean, huge deal with a very nice handwritten deal. And actually very interesting, when I got this uh, new award, I actually got a personal letter from the current president Cordova. I was actually very pleased about it. Yeah. Very nice. It was, and it was a fairly detailed. Somebody done a search on it because it wasn't just congratulations, but it was, you know. They spent some time on the letter. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they think that's like, oh, it was nice. So, all in all, Purdue has been really pretty. Yeah. I got good. one. I'm going to ask you: What is your new career aspirations after leaving Purdue University? Oh, yeah. Well, it's, I still have five PhD students that I work with here, but those are co-chair, and I have eleven PhD students at Tsinghua that are co-chairing. But I'm planning to continue. I started two scientific technical journals. I plan to continue co-editing them. I have two book series which is very successful, and I plan to do, one is in industrial engineering, the other one in human factors, I plan to continue doing them. I plan to continue doing the Xinhua uh, headship for a while, and I took on the new initiative for um, the IT, which is a major initiative, and um, and I'm kind of involved also with the U.S. National Laboratory. So I think I will be moving more to national and international contributions and then strictly localized. And I will move more and more out of the Ph.D. supervision, even though I'm still mm -hmm. doing it, and more to the global impact of science and technology in terms of the physical location, it doesn't matter so much where I am because I communicate by phone, by email, by fax. So I don't, you know, I, I'm really not restricted where I am. And uh, for a moment we are here in Lafayette, but I'm not sure in the right. 
longer. We are here for the winter and the four months they spend in Michigan in Sagata. Because I like the waters. I swim there every morning. I row every morning. <laughs> and, and then I'm uh, back to my office there and do my work. That's nice. Yeah. Do you have a favorite Purdue tradition and all the time that you've been here one comes to mind? Or an outstanding event? Oh, take oh both. my, the, the place I always take all my students <laughs> and usually I take new faculty is the pub um, for lunch. It, it's not really a drinking place, but it's just the setting of the right. Understand. deal uh, has been there since 1948. That's right, yes. So, but I don't, otherwise, I um, I used to have the tradition and I have still tradition with the students, we always get together periodically and have some fun, but uh, that I think will kind of change probably. Right. Right. I'm not a great footballer or, or basketball, the kind of deal is more cutting my wife who does it. So I, I just kind of a strong supporter of Purdue as an academic um, institution of higher learning and uh, I hope whatever one can do in this international type activity, that some of it will significantly benefit Purdue. And I would like to see the IE school. Uh, I just talked to Professor Peckney. I really think um, we need to be number one. If we can't be number one, we need to step aside. And there is no reason why we can't be number one if we put our intellectual resources together. We come in with strong collaboration, we put our feelings aside and concentrate on the good of science, technology and education. And uh, I think we can make the School of Industry Engineering the right. undisputed number. Right. Any one. closing comments or uh, as you look back, anything you'd like to say? Oh, it's an interesting one. Um, I think probably the best closing deal is that the time at Purdue was one of the smartest moves I done when in 1971 I came to Purdue. I think it probably was the smartest move. In 1970 I interviewed again, they pulled me aside similar like Jim to University of Michigan and Harvard. I was only one and a half year out and I said I'm I moving parallel because there was no possibility. To get. Oh, one item which is kind of stuck with me for a long time. When I came here, the dean was a dean, Gosh, was the dean of engineering. And Professor Leinkula said when he gave the offer to me that the dean of engineering was extremely impressed with my publications. And so I, as a naive kid, I interpreted to mean that he really a very person, very interested, and I thought he's basically my researcher. He said, what a neat thing for a young person to come here and work with the dean. So I asked uh, Professor Lankula, what is exactly his area? He said, oh no, I, uh, no. He counted it and he looked the number and he looked where you published them. Because he said, at that time I published many of them in IIE Transaction, which was the main journal. Right. And so then I really realized that administration seemed to be bean counters more bean counters than <laughs> quality counters <laughs> and quality measures. I think it would be, it would be a very nice experience. And you know, I also was blessed with a lot of outstanding colleagues. You see, to make a university great, it is the quality of the colleagues, both academically and as human, and the quality of the students, both as human beings and as you know, intellectual scholars. I have been really blessed. I have been blessed. I. I have really the very best people that I had a chance to interact all the time, and it was always a pleasure. You know, there are some people that we people have differences, but heck, you know, you put them aside, at least I put aside. If they cannot put it aside, that's a problem, but I just put aside, and in the end, you think of Move on. Move on and think what is good for the school, because basically, what is good for the school is good for you. Because right, people exactly. don't realize it, but right. you're out of the school. So if suddenly the quality of the school goes up, we get better students. I end up having better students. Quality goes up, easier for people to get funding. You know, the whole uh, thing, our reputation goes up. Right. Do you think the funding support on a long time you've been here, has it changed? Has it gone uh, 
I, I, I think um, it changed drastically, um, and I think it will. Ch it, it it goes through cycles. Cycles like the tide, the narrow tide, the wide tide, the middle tide. If you keep it in your cupboard, you can use them all of them. Okay. You see what happens in the last administration. The tremendous emphasis has been on money, and you see money is input. What I'm interested is in output. Because you see, when people get a Nobel Prize, a Nobel laureate, they do not judge how much money the Nobel laureate had in doing his or her research. So I think we will move, I think, hopefully to a new cycle where the emphasis would be on the impact and output. And if you can do the output with less money, it's great. If you if you couldn't do the output because you didn't get the money, but ultimately it's the output. You know, we had Herbert Brown, who was the only Nobel laureate here. I don't think ever anybody asked Herbert, how much money do you bring in? It was the impact of his work. The and research. Yeah. And we had a person in education, in biology, I cannot remember now his name, uh, uh, who developed the self-paced laboratory one. He had no money for it practically, but it became a standard around the world. In Sam Postaway? So, yeah, Postaway, yeah, Sam Postaway, yeah. Postaway, thank you. Good memory, yeah. You know, the fellow had a major, major international impact. Sure did. Yet, my understanding is he had very nominal money in the development of it. And so I think we will see that change, I think where we'll measure impact. It doesn't mean that money is not important. Right. Money is important if you need the money to make the impact. But if you are a mathematician and you need only a piece of paper, and you are so brilliant that you can germinate fellowship, your student can get NSF fellowship, because all the NSF fellows would right. want to come to work with you, and they are all supported by fellowship. You may not need any money. Right. Exactly. And then it's OK, because you are so eminent that they will be getting the and I think that change, I think, may occur, maybe may, will occur down the road, I'm 100% sure. Because, you know, just to add one thing as a closing one, I write a lot of references a year for faculty, 50, 60 a year. And Stanford, for example, for years adopted a situation where the faculty goes up for promotion, he or she must erase the dollar amount of total funding they have or had. And if they haven't erased it, it is the responsibility of the department head to erase it before the resume goes to the other faculty and goes out for references. So the money cannot be a criteria for your promotion. Understand for you know. Sure, understand. Right. So I think now money would be you could argue if you don't have money, maybe you don't get good raises, but not relating to your promotion. I think that's kind of an right. interesting uh, one. Any, Any last question you have? Uh, no, and anything that you wanted to share or, or uh, in closing is got things covered pretty much? I think we are, maybe the only thing I want to mention that before I came to Purdue, when I was a doctoral student at the University of uh, Birmingham University, Lillian Gilbreth came there for a conference in 67 and she wanted a strong man to look after her and I was assigned as her chaperone for two days to Lillian Gilbreth and I didn't really understand at the time the value and impact of her. Oh, See, and did, did you, you didn't know who she was? Oh, I knew which one, but I didn't quite know how, right. you know, down the road, whatever. yeah, yeah, and, and so that kind of has been, and of course, subsequently, her daughters came here, and I had uh, you met her, Ernestine. yeah, Ernestine. I think is she she has passed away, passed away because she would have been ninety over ninety by now. Oh yeah, right. Yeah. Oh, she passed away. She passed away about a year and a half ago or so. Uh -huh. right. Yeah. Well, I don't know. By the way, once this is off, I have a question not relating to okay. this. Uh, I'll turn it off in a minute. Yeah. But I, in closing, I do want to say that the School of Industrial Engineering had a symposium retirement banquet for you, and it was an occasion to celebrate Professor Salvini's accomplishments and take stock in the field in which he has held an enormous impact. And I want to thank you very much for this opportunity to interview. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <coughs>